Hello, this is Greg Allison with Galactic Gregs, coming to you on the 5th of February, 2021. Time on deck is 2051 hours <clears throat> Central Standard Time. Today is the 50th anniversary of the landing of Apollo 14 on the moon. Yes, and uh, it was actually originally scheduled for 1970, but it didn't happen that year. You might say this was a return to flight or return to landing on the moon mission after Apollo 13's tragedy. <clears throat> well, Apollo 13 wasn't a full-blown tragedy. It was actually the most successful failure in the history of man's space flight so far. And the, the astronauts were saved. They just didn't get to land on the moon. The landing was aborted. So the, <clears throat> the previous landing on the moon was actually 19 November, 1969. So uh, it had been a year and a quarter since man had landed on the moon between Apollo 12 and Apollo 13. So <clears throat> actually Apollo 14 was the eighth manned Apollo mission. And <clears throat> excuse me, I got a bit of a bug here today. And uh, so what I'm gonna tell you here today about is I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of the anomalies. Everybody knows about uh, Alan Shepard's uh, playing golf. <laughs> we will we'll mention that. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, three of the failures uh, that they encountered in flight and how that nearly vexed them. But then we're, and we're going to end this with <clears throat> what's really the enduring legacy of the Apollo 14 mission that lives to this day and will for hundreds of years to come. <laughs> Yes, Apollo trees, moon trees, moon trees. And I'm going to show you also a quick little uh, clip, or at least show you the granddaughter of Stuart Rusa, who was the astronaut who had the moon tree seeds on board the command module, Kitty Hawk, of this mission, Apollo 14. <laughs> so bear with me. <clears throat> so if you've not already subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. Bang the update notification bell and click all because I'll bring you a lot of different uh, stories in the area of space, space science, and I may do some other science and technology uh, videos also. This has been primarily a space channel though. Now, I'll cover history, I cover what's going on, I will cover future projections, and I'm even working up concepts for a Venus colony. <laughs> that may sound crazy, but check out my videos on that, and there will be more to come. So I'm actually doing some actual groundbreaking engineering, which is announced first on this channel along with some other things. So stay tuned. And I'll also cover some history of things I've done in space. So it'll be a lot of fun. We'll, we'll cover a lot, a broad range of topics because I got a broad background. <laughs> kind of a big broad guy anyway, yeah? <laughs> all right, so all that said, let's get on with it here. <clears throat> so the mission landed, it, here, here's our answer. The mission landed on the moon, as I said, on the 5th of February, 1971, in the Frau Moro formation, which was the target for Apollo 13. The lander that they landed in was called the Antares. And the commander was Alan Shepard. The lunar module pilot was Edgar Mitchell. Yeah, he was the one that did all the psychic stuff later. <laughs> so overhead in the command module, that's our lander, that's Antares. And overhead, I love it. See the window right there? <laughs> They look out at the uh, command module when they're coming up to dock with it. There's your uh, docking adapter part of it. Well, yeah, they actually dock in the center. That's one of your target guys. <clears throat> so, yeah, you know, we're going to talk about this little docking adapter in a, in a moment here. This is the Kitty Hawk, the command module that was piloted by uh, Stuart Russo. And the capsule is right here. This is the service module here. This is all the support stuff. These guys go all the way to the main and go all the way home. Uh, all the time, except when they're in the litter module, they're in this capsule right here. They're set right on the top, tippy top of the big launch vehicle. <laughs> so the landing was at uh, 4.03.02 p.m. Uh, Zulu time. That's the time they landed. <laughs> so. <clears throat> There were several malfunctions in route to the moon. And we're going to talk, like I said, we're going to talk about those because they came, one of them we really feared was going to end the Apollo program. So the launch actually occurred on the 31st of January, 1971. 
And it was at 2103.02 Zulu time. And this was with the Saturn V SA509. And it occurred from Launch Complex 39A. Yeah, this is the same launch complex that SpaceX is today launching their Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9 launch vehicles from. And maybe we'll launch Starship from in the not too distant future with people among other locations. So we shall have to see how that goes. <clears throat> but right now it's a Falcon launch site. So yeah, the splashdown, this occurred, uh, this occurred the 9th, 9 February, 1971. It was at 2105 Zulu time. And, in, uh, and they were recovered by the USS New Orleans. Uh, but during two moon rocks, the astronauts collected 94.38 pounds of rock, which is uh, 42.8 kilograms. <clears throat> They left several scientific missions uh, or instruments, I should say, on the lunar surface, including one which uh, uh, they were actually had, a, had some little explosive type devices called thumpers they set off so they could seismically sail on the moon where science and geologists could kind of get a notion about the depths and the types of regolith and layers underneath. <clears throat> There's Alan Shepard. Yeah, back here, that's Edgar Mitchell reading the map as he's doing his little bunny hop. I think he's probably in the air right there. I don't know if that's what's on the ground or not. <laughs> and he kind of hopped along on the lunar surface. Now, the funny thing is, is that everybody knows this mission mostly for the fact that Alan Shepard played golf on the moon, supposedly. Well, he actually took uh, two golf balls up with him and he did a makeshift, uh, makeshift uh, club using the handle of one of the little soil uh, collectors, the sample collectors. And he had another, uh, he had a professional golfer actually attached the, the, the golf head to it. And, and he trained him and he practiced doing this in a full space suit on earth. And it actually had, you know, some people think he'd just come up with this and, and snuck it on in on NASA, but the JSC center director actually knew about this in advance and kind of reluctant, I guess, reluctantly blessed it. <laughs> so what we do know is that, uh, uh, it's it, it was figured that his first ball went about you know even when he struck him it went out of, you couldn't see him on the camera so he said they went for miles and miles and miles but actually uh, the the first one went about uh, probably 25 yards and then you know there's been some photographic analysis done since including photos from the uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter and they have determined that uh, the second ball probably traveled about 45 yards 42 yards excuse me 42 yards so. Yep, that's kind of what happened. So it makes it kind of interesting. <laughs> and this is a photograph taken from the Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this is the actual place where the Antares module touched down. And that is the actual module. That's the descent stage left here. You know, it goes down in two stages, a descent stage and an ascent stage. I'm gonna show you in a moment. Now it had been hoped that, so they, they kind of made it around through this area right here and it, the uh, geologists had hoped that they would actually make it all the way up to uh, the, the realm of this crater, the, the Kong crater, but they didn't quite make it. Apparently they got up here close to the saddle rock. That's about as far as they got. Remember these guys were walking over. This was just before they come out with the uh, lunar rover, which made a huge difference, you know, in Apollo 15. This is the last mission without a rover. So uh, it's kind of interesting. So you can, you can kind of see where they trekked along even here. A little bit if you look carefully this is sort of left the asleep instrument which is the instrument right there <laughs> anyway so uh i'm gonna skip this because we're about to go in i'm gonna get out of this we're gonna go into it and i'm gonna tell you about the little problems they encountered en route to the moon yeah they had some serious problems you know southern was or one of these missions in those days that did not encounter very very white knuckle moments some serious problems uh, many of you may recall that, you know, because we know uh, Apollo 11, you know, the landing computer was overwhelmed. Uh, they had uh, they had a lot of trouble landing. Uh, and uh, Armstrong got it down, you know, pretty well, but holy smoke, you know, uh, Buzz was really fighting that landing computer. <laughs> and then they had a problem uh, on ascent. Uh, Apollo 12 was hit by lightning on ascent uh, at launch. Uh, we know that... Uh, <laughs> That Apollo 13, of course, had an oxidizer tank explode in the service module, 
And those guys would not have made it home for, for the lunar module. Of course, a guy I used to work for, Fred Hayes. Now, I did not do an Apollo 13 anniversary video. I really, really wanted to because I've worked for Fred Hayes twice. So I'm on, at some point in the future, I'm going to do a video about that called Lessons Not Learned from Apollo 13. Things we're not applying today that we should have learned from that flight. So hang on for that. Okay, all that said. <laughs> so what happened on the way to the moon that caused them a problem? Well, as you might know, going up to the moon inside of the Saturn V S4B uh, stage, uh, you know, if you can imagine a tube around, you know, pretty much most of this stuff right here, uh, they're trucking along to the moon. They just had the translunar injection burn. So they're on the way to the moon. Well, at some point, the uh, command module has to come out and turn around and dock with the lunar module and extract it from the S4B stage. And it was the job in this case of, uh, of uh, the command uh, module pilot, Stuart Rusa, to do this maneuver. Now he was really, he practiced this many times and when he uh, did this turnaround, he was real happy about it because it's called the transposition maneuver. And the thing he was so happy about is he thought he had done it in record time and he thought he had the record break in uh, least amount of fuel concern. So he thought he was really on top of it. He was real proud of himself. So there was a problem. It wasn't his fault. <laughs> he couldn't extract it. He could not extract the lunar module from the S4B stage. It wouldn't come out. This hadn't happened before. You know? So he tried for two hours. And what's happened is the document uh, mechanisms weren't catching the document backers, the document mechanisms that is actually, you know, they got these plates that guide them in and then they're supposed to lock down. And they're, they're in the center, there's a, a probe. So they tried several times to make this dock and it just wasn't happening. And uh, for two hours, they wrestled it. Mission controllers were sweating bullets because they, you know, the Apollo program was, you know, like a lot of things today in, in space. Uh, it was not the popper in some political sectors. There were a lot of politicians that wanted to kill it. In fact, had it not been for the tragedy and the human drama of Apollo 13, it probably would have ended early. So here we had a problem and they just couldn't figure out what was going on. And they were uh, fearing this would be an end of program because they wouldn't be able to accomplish their mission. Everybody would, you know, uh, when things are paid for with tax, dollar, uh, tax dollars, there's a lot to be accounted for. There's a lot of people question, question. There's a lot of critics. You've got to satisfy a lot of people. Unlike, you know, today, uh, we, we can be happy that Musk plays for Starship development out of his own pocket. So he don't mind crashing and blowing a bunch of them up. He did the same thing with his landers, uh, with uh, his uh, first stages that were coming back uh, from his uh, Falcon 9 rocket, later the, the Falcon Heavy, like when he was landing them on the decks of boats. Quite a few of those exploded early on. Quite a few, but he he fin he kept up with it. He persevered because he was paying for it, and in the end, it was phenomenal what he accomplished because he could take the risk. He didn't have to answer to anybody but himself, and he probably wasn't going to fire himself anytime soon. <laughs> so, but that's not so true with politics. So that they were trying this and trying this, and uh, finally they they were almost about guilt. They decided to try it with a docking probe retracted. So when they retracted the docking probe, you know, they got these pedals that come in and, and, and then you have to, you know, they just really guide you in. And then you have, a, a, things have to catch. And then you, then you sink up. So there's a soft dock and a hard dock. So, but when they did that, it worked, fortunately. So they were able, so Russo was able to extract the uh, limb and Tari's lunar, lunar excursion module limb LM, I often use that. It's been called LEM, LM alternately. But he was able to extract it from the S4B upper stage. And you go, Greg, why S4B? S is the doesn't matter for stage, right? S4 is a three-stage vehicle. A lot of people realize that. The S4B was actually designed originally for another concept that we were considering doing back when we were not looking at lunar orbit rendezvous, <laughs> lunar direct, which was going to require a much bigger rocket, which was going to be called the Nova, which would have been a four-stage rocket. Wow, that would have been a big beast, <laughs> bigger than the Saturn V. So that rocket was not developed thanks to lunar orbit rendezvous, but also it meant we didn't have space stations, a lot of infrastructure that we might have had otherwise, and so it was a lot easier to totally cancel the program, and there was nothing left. <laughs> Got to start quicker. If there wasn't nothing left over, it was done. Yeah, no infrastructure. So that's another story. <laughs> so 
he made the extraction. So they're on the way to the moon, thankfully, for that. That part, you know, it was over with. Ah, but, you know, that wasn't the end of problems. <laughs> After separation uh, from uh, Kitty Hawk, the Antares was on its way down. And they found they had another problem. They had an abort signal going on. Eep, eep, eep. It kept telling them to abort. <laughs> and so they, 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 they thought about it. They thought, well, it was a support switch. And the best they could come up with was, was they figured in this switch, there was a solder ball floating around. And the solder ball got stuck between the switch and the contact to the circuit, making a, a, a complete circuit. So it was like it was the, the board was switched in position. They found they could momentarily, so they, what confirmed it to them is they could tap on the panel and it would quit going off for a little bit. But then it was starting an amp, amp, amp. The problem with that is this. See, the lunar lander, and this is my uh, salt shaker lunar lander, my pepper shaker command module, okay? <laughs> the lunar lander has the descent stage and the ascent stage. Each has an engine. So the uh, if that abort was going off when the ascent, uh, or excuse me, when the descent engine was firing, it would the, the flight computer inside would automatically uh, uh, do an abort execution, which meant it would fire the ascent engine off. And so the guys would go, so if you're coming in, you're trying to land on the moon, and suddenly that little solder ball gets in there and it goes, amp, amp. well, there you go. Poof, off you go. You ain't got no choice. So they wanted to try to fix it. And what they ran into was that no matter what they did, it, it, uh, they found that the software was all hardwired. You know, today we, we burn stuff in, we saw, we burn our software in the chips. It's called, you know, prom memory, uh, or, you know, we now call them, you know, programmable logic devices, PLDs or several things work. But uh, basically we, look, we burn a lot of software in today. And it's uh, just like then, this was hardware, hardwired. And <clears throat> they couldn't upload a change to it. But they did discover a way to fix it. MIT got involved with it because MIT, you know, the Draper Labs you know, and Lincoln Labs have long been involved with the, the guidance navigation control stuff. So they were able to figure out um, what the problem was and they figured out a workaround. But the workaround was this. They had to fool the, the, the system, the computer into thinking it had already fired the ascent engine so that when uh, the board went off going down, it would think the ascent engine was already fired and it wouldn't try to fire it. So they had to trick the system to fool it. To do it, they had Mitchell enter some, some data, some parameters and to, to fool it out. And Mitchell was able to accomplish that just minutes before the descent engine fired. Like I said, if that had happened while the descent engine was firing, it would have aborted. And it was constantly going in and out. So that was a real risk. They probably wouldn't have made it to the surface if they hadn't figured out a fix. And they got it just minutes ahead. Because this thing was already coming down. Once you're coming down, you're coming down. You got to do something. You're going to fire that ASIN engine or you're going to abort. You have to. I mean, so that, so now, so they're coming in the moon. They got that fixed. And guess what? The, 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 the radar, the landing radar couldn't lock on the lunar surface. Now they got another problem. Because the navigation computer did not have the uh, altitude or the descent rate of the computer uh, of the uh, limb coming in. So Antares brains basically didn't know where it was and how fast it was moving. So how was it going to properly uh, execute its functions? Well, <laughs> there was another problem. And uh, so they, they eventually fixed it by uh, toggling the circuit breaker off and on and resetting the flight computer. And then it caught lock is it was about 22,000 feet above the lunar surface. Now the abort rules had said that if you were 10,000 feet above the surface and you didn't have lock, you had to abort. So they were getting pretty close. I mean, you're on decent, you, you're gonna close that two miles roughly and no time flat. So that was really, really close. Now, <laughs> some think that Shepard might have tried to have landed anyway to overrode it and did a manual landing. And that's not easily done, by the way. That's not an easy trick. But they thought Shepard might have done it. As it so happens, uh, Shepard, Alan Shepard, managed to bring the limb down to the uh, really close to the landing point. So much so that he was more on target with that mission than any of the, of the six landers that landed on the moon. So he nailed it better than any of them. So maybe he could have succeeded. <laughs> but 
So they had several close calls, you know, coming out of the S4B stage. They had, you know, like I said, they had that uh, uh, bad abort uh, signal and then the, the, the landing radar not locking. Several, several things. How would people handle all that today? Everything's going, eh, 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 you know, uh, failing left and right and you got to stay cool, calm and collected and work it out. You can't panic. <laughs> no, that's why the astronauts had to write stuff. They weren't the kind of guys who would panic. You know, panic, you lose your mind. And you, you really, really messed up. So fortunately for us, they made it, they landed. And uh, they had quite a good mission there on the moon. Now, what, what we're going to talk about next is uh, the long, the long uh, lasting legacy of the uh, missionary. I'm going to share something with you. We're going to go somewhere else. We're going to go to moon trees. Just so happened the astronaut Stuart Rusa, this is him right here. He had been a smoke jumper for the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, the U.S. Forest Service uh, head knew him, remembered him. His name was Ed Cliff. And he had a proposal. He went to uh, Stuart and said, hey, why don't you take a bunch of trees from the U.S. Forest Service to the moon? So he had these in his personal kit. He had several hundred tree seeds. Here's one of them right here. Several hundred tree seeds uh, in his personal kit and the command module which was again, uh, Kitty Hawk. So he was up there in Kitty Hawk with this as he's going around the moon. So the, the upshot of that is there's several trees today, there are hundreds of them. We don't even know where they all are today, but there is a list of uh, a certain number of them. There were certain uh, trees that were donated by the Forest Service. See, they, the Forest Service got them and hatched them and started growing them and then they transplanted them. Most of them were transplanted around the 4th of July not the 4th of July, in 1776, the bicentennial year, not exactly the 4th of July. You can see most of them here have a 1776 transplant date, although a few others donated. And these are the known locations. There's, there's several that, there's hundreds of trees that came out of this. So this is not all of them. So uh, we don't really know where they all went now. I got a cute picture, look at that. <laughs> wow, let's make it a great thumbnail, right? So, me, uh, get out of that one. Go back to this list. So what they had was sycamore, Douglas fir, lobolly pines, and they had some, I guess, fill pines or some other pine. Oh, that's a sweet gum tree. Mm. You know, if it wasn't for the Tamiflu, you can get a sweet gum. I'd hate those trees. <laughs> I've got them all over my place. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. Uh, they had some redwood trees. So here's all the locations. So one's at the Botanical Garden in Birmingham. I've been there. One's at State Capitol in Alabama, Troy, Alabama, Tuscumbia. We got some in Arizona, Arkansas, California's got several of them. I think Alabama may have the most of the ones that's known at least. Florida's got, a, got quite a few. Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Indiana, Kansas, Louisiana, Maryland. Massachusetts, Mississippi, Mississippi, Missouri, New Jersey. And probably every state got one. And maybe we just don't know whether Oregon got quite a few. Now here's where I'll tell you where you we're going to find the most that are recognized. And you know, the Sarah's more to Arkansas. There are seven of these trees, if I can find it on here, at the uh here we go. At the US Space and Rocket Center here in Huntsville, Alabama. Seven, five sycamores and two pines. Auburn University has a lot barley pine and a sycamore. So they got two. Tuskegee has a lot barley pine. So yeah, we've got a bunch of these here in Alabama. But seven right here in Huntsville at the Space and Rocket Center. I've seen these moon trees. Uh, it's kind of interesting. See, the cool thing is a sycamore tree can last 600 years. In fact, a sycamore tree is the largest delicious tree and all the Eastern United States. Good choice. This is a legacy. I, you know, uh, you know, you know, you go back to this time, Columbus hadn't even got here. You know, we're just past the 500th anniversary of Columbus discovered America, supposedly. Of course, the Vikings were here before. But think about it. the US, you know, you know, we're only about a third of this in age in the United States, a little better than a third. So 
600 years is a long legacy and these trees should live. They should be alive. So these are the last, will be the last living members of the Apollo program, sycamore trees. The last living members that went around the moon in the 1970s. <laughs> Planted by Stuart Rusa. So hats off to Stuart Rusa and what he did for us uh, in that regard. He, like I said, he had been a smoke jumper and he was a guy who had to get that uh, command module where it would pull the limb out. If he hadn't made that, we wouldn't be here to, we wouldn't be talking about this today. <laughs> Not in this celebratory type fashion. So a lot of kids got involved in these moon trees and still can. You can go find these trees and look at them, put your hand on them and know that their seed went around the moon. You know, and the seed is the, all the genetic blueprint. It's really the same thing. It just hadn't started to grow, hadn't germinated. <laughs> but that's amazing. That's just amazing. Now, it just so happens I've had his granddaughter on my Green Greg's channel. His granddaughter is an actress and she's actually won an award. This is her right here. This is Miss Daniela Rusa. And she had the bug. She had contracted the bug that was going around as a young person early on uh, when, when this stuff just started in the United States and a lot of people didn't think it would hit young people hard. She was very athletic, by the way, and it did hit her hard. She went to the hospital, it hit her real hard, but she's fully recovered and back in her acting career and she's doing excellent at it. And she, she favors her dad quite a bit too, don't she? I'm her granddad, look at this. There's her granddad. Stuart, and there is Daniela. Wow, it's uncanny how much she favors him. And I'm sure that he is, would be proud of her today for what she's accomplished. Maybe I'll just let you hear her voice here a minute. Another video in the series about COVID-19. A lot of you, uh -oh. I don't want to have that bad word said in this video. So, so I can get her talking. So she's talking. They were like, you know what? I don't care if it's negative. We know that you have COVID. All right, there we are. Now we got all the bad words said. So this video is going to get some <laughs> strikes on it, probably. But there we are. She uh, she's smiling now. She's happy. She's on her bright future as as an actress. And it's it's good to see that the descendants of the Apollo astronauts, several of them, are excelling in their life dreams. And these trees will be here long after we're all long gone. <laughs> They belong after the United States is forgotten even. <laughs> Hopefully there'll still be people to, to be able to look at them and appreciate them. And maybe the placards and people will be able to understand where they went from. Hopefully our technology, uh, technological civilization will survive and we'll just marvel at them, you know, for hundreds of years, for hundreds of years. Let me stop that share. <laughs> so there you have it. Moon trees, imagine that all over the earth. They've been invaded by the moon. <laughs> So there you are, my friends. I hope you found that interesting that we have this long lasting legacy of the Apollo program. You know, you can see the descendants of these astronauts. Many of them are doing very well in their lives, as you might expect from such motive, highly motivated people. And you can see that, uh, <clears throat> that this was an interesting mission. It was, a, and if it had failed, there wouldn't have been an Apollo 15, 16, and 17. And those missions, you know, I was so glad for Apollo 17. At least we finally got a geologist up there. And he was like a kid in a candy shop, you know, all excited about what he was finding. Now, the astronauts had been trained by geologists, but to the geologist, it was way different, made a big difference. That shows us the value of getting scientists involved in space and to do the stuff direct hands on. So there you have it. Of course, it, you know, having the steely eyed missile men fly these rockets when everything's going to pop and boom and break. That matters too. <laughs> Gotta have the perspective, the nerves for it. So I hope you have the nerves for all my other videos to come. <laughs> we got a lot more stuff coming. And uh, this has been an active uh, week for me here on Galactic Gregs. And I hope just to get the pace back up a little better than what I've had it in the past. I'm just, I'm a super busy guy, incredibly busy. I do have a full time job working NASA stuff. I work about 10 hours a day. I've got a side business, I have an aquaponics operation. I have a market garden. I have a commercial worm farm. I have, this is my second YouTube channel. My other one is a larger channel, one from the Green Greg's channel. So that keeps me really bit beyond busy. Plus, I started the uh, 
an organization called the Freedom Restoration Foundation. They got a Facebook site. You can check us out there if you're interested in, in uh, restoration of our freedoms. <laughs> not interested in that? That's a whole different matter. Anyway, I got a lot of things cooking. Oh yeah, I'm also on. The, I'm a state director on an MP task force, uh, electromagnetic pulse. Uh, I'm much into power grid defense. I've chaired two power grid defense conferences. Uh, I don't sleep very much, my friends. So that's why I'm challenged to get these videos out, but I do enjoy it when I can. There's so many things I want to talk about. There's so much that I want to get out here. And I wish I had more time to sit down and do the analysis and things like that. I did for my uh, Venus video. I did a lot of mathematics for that. I did a video on uh, on green graves or actually calculated how many joules it take to evaporate 600 feet of ocean water worldwide. And then I converted that into how many uh, little boy atomic bombs it would take to give you that much energy. It was crazy. There was a reason I did it. You have to just have to see that video. Or somebody thinking that happened to Earth and somehow there were some animals, some creatures surviving. <laughs> so I just had to take a shot at it, guys. It's like, what? You gotta be kidding me. All right. You know, sometimes I take things on and, and yeah, I can do the analysis. I can do the numbers. I am an engineer. I'm not a journalist like a lot of your other YouTube space channels. I am an engineer. I actually actively work this stuff. I got design flying in space right now on the International Space Station. <laughs> And there's, there's industrial equipment out there I've designed. There's stuff in the M1 tank, uh, the F-15 aircraft, but mostly, almost all, most, by far the vast bulk of my career has been space, some military, a little bit of commercial, but also in addition to my full-time day job, I've always had side ventures. I have been a space, very avid national level space advocate and space entrepreneur. That's why I got this award right here, Space Pioneer Award from the National Space Society for space entrepreneurship because I started, I was a new space. I started a space company, a launch company, developed hybrid rockets, launched from altitude balloons. So we'll have a lot to talk about. I've had a lot of fun in my life. <laughs> sort of, and I, sometimes there's some, a few people, if challenge, who's this newcomer, you know, on this channel, who's this person, you know, and I post a video somewhere, it's like, really? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Guys, I've been around the block <laughs> quite a few times. Anyway, so you, I hope you all enjoyed the things I've got to bring you. Go check out my older videos. A lot more stuff coming and hopefully as i get uh, things may transition my time and give me more time to put more depth into some of these things but I'm definitely with the venus habitat stuff yeah i got some interesting stuff coming there and i am putting some time in into that so everyone i gotta say thank you very heartily for watching